Hey, you all, Farmer Jesse here. Got a super fun bonus episode for you all this week. I recently got the chance to speak with Daryl Ward of So Right Seeds about the subject of running and starting small seed business. And in particular, I was curious about how small seed businesses like So Right Seeds were dealing with new genetically engineered tomato variety that hit the shelves recently. Uh, for those who are not aware, the average Joe or Jane is not going to accidentally stumble into genetically engineered seed, at least not up until now. But a new variety Variety hit the market recently that any grower can buy. And so I wanted to ask Daryl about that and his business. And we talk about the small seed company business and marketing and a whole bunch more. It's a lot of fun. And in the name of full disclosure, So Right Seeds is a sponsor of not only the No Till Growers YouTube channel, which I hope you're subscribed to, but also this podcast. However, we have strict rules about having sponsors on the podcast. One, it's a bonus episode, so it's not taking place of your regular podcast space. And two, sponsors have to get nerdy with us and add value. That's the rule. This podcast is not an advertisement. And of course, Daryl was totally game to geek out with me. So without further rambling from me, here is my chat with Daryl Ward of So Right Seeds. Hey, Jesse, how are you? I'm well, Daryl. How are you? Doing great. Good to hear. Good to hear. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. We're we're super excited to do this interview, and I have a lot of questions, for, especially on the home gardener scale. So uh, so my understanding is that you were, you know, you've, you have been a gardener for a long time, you and your partner. So how, uh, you know, how did you get into gardening? And then, you know, how did that evolve <laughs> into a seed business? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you, um, it goes all the way back. Uh, so I'm one of uh, 11 children and my dad was a school teacher. So you can imagine the, how tight the food budget was. And we gardened, we lived on an acre and a quarter and it was pretty much all garden. And, you know, it, at times it seemed like a lot of work, you know, we couldn't watch TV unless we were snapping beans, but I, from that experience, um, I just learned to love gardening and I, I have that compulsion. Like I need to be growing something all the time. It's just who I am. And, you know, one of the first things my wife and I did after we got married was we started a garden and, um, kind of, we've always had one everywhere we went. And so, uh, I'm that crazy guy who in grew. 50 or 60 different varieties of tomatoes in his backyard just because there was, it was hard to say no to any variety of tomato. Yeah. I, I love that. Are there some of those, I'm just like imagining growing up with, you know, that large of a garden and that many family members, were there like crops from that time that really stand out that like, I don't know that you think back on, like that was that stuck with me forever. Like that's a crop I love now. And it just brings a ton of nostalgia back. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the the carrots we grew there were awesome. I love carrots. I love growing carrots, and, um, uh, and well, really, and so much the pumpkins and the squash. I, and seriously, that's what we ate. My mother jarred it all up. We had a whole room down in the basement that was just floor to ceiling uh, shelves full of glass jars full of food that she had preserved from from the garden. And uh, it was the common chore during you know her prep meal prep time to send somebody, usually me, down there to go get a jar of this or that. So um, I guess that's the memory that really sticks with me is the if if somebody's serious about it and and really puts the time and energy into it, it is possible to grow a good portion of the produce that you would need over a year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially like that's a pretty good scale. And if you're really intentional about it, you can get a decent, uh, you know, a lar- lot of food out of that. Um, yeah. So was this in, was that you're in Missouri now? Was this also in Missouri when you were growing up? No, I actually grew up in Idaho. Okay. Um, and so here's kind of, I'll just give you a quick life uh, summary of me. So I grew up in Idaho. Uh, and about age 12, I started farming with my sister and brother-in-law. And so, you know, of course, we're in Idaho. We grew potatoes, uh, 
grain and alfalfa hay. So all through my high school years, I worked on that farm and then um, went to college. I have an ag degree uh, and then decided law school was a good idea. So I went to law school and came out here to Kansas City to practice environmental law and did that for seven or eight years. Loved it. But then I um, got bit by a tick and got Lyme disease and it took me down. I was on for about nine years with Lyme disease. Um, and when I came out of that, my wife had uh, started teaching school, really saved our family financially during that time. Um, and I just couldn't get her to, to quit. She was loving teaching school, and I knew that the, that just wasn't going to work for the family for me to go back to a 60-hour-a-week attorney job. So I started having to think long and hard about uh, what sort of business to start. and. Um, I, I had always kind of thought I wanted to start a business, and uh, that was kind of the opportunity for me to do it. And so we landed on the seed business, and that's so that's kind of the way we transitioned from being um, people who love gardening. Uh, and the other thing that I love doing is I used to run seed exchanges where you know you get on a form board or something and and everybody and make arrangements and everybody sends. Uh, 10 packs of, of a variety of seed that they've saved. And then my kitchen table would be completely full of all these seeds. And I'd stir the pile and then send them back. You know, everybody gets a different variety back than what they've sent in. And, and I used to run those seed exchanges quite frequently and loved doing that. And so it was kind of a natural transition into a seed company. That's very cool. I uh, <laughs> I like the idea of just like stirring them up and then sending out everybody a, a, a packet. I mean, I was a little more intentional. I wanted to make sure everybody got good stuff back. But the the one benefit of uh, running it is you for sure got dibs on the most interesting seeds. So that was that was good times. I I love doing it. Yeah, that's very cool. Um, can you give us a little bit of an idea of your growing region there? I you know, is it? I mean, it's kind of I think of the Midwest, but are you sort of uh, you know what's your annual rainfall and those sorts of things? Yeah, um, so we're 6B. Our first frost date is, or our last frost date is April 18th. Um, our first frost date is typically um, average is August 18th. So we get that six month of frost free growing. Uh, on average, I think I'd have to look it up for sure. We're pretty wet. Um, maybe about between 35 and 40 inches of rain a year would be my best guess. Uh, I still do irrigate. I, I um, have, I did, there's, there's usually periods in September or so when we get really dry here. And so I, I, that's when I mainly irrigate. Um, and, you know, it's humid. It's not uh, North Carolina humid, but it's humid here. And um, I don't know, it, it, we, uh, I've had great luck growing things here. Coming from Idaho, where we had such a short growing season, um, you know, this is, it's almost feels like a boon to have a full six months without any frost. Yeah. I, I love that. Like, um, uh, you know, that you're, especially like coming from a, no I haven't gone from like a northern region to a cooler region. I went from a slightly southern region to a slightly cooler region. So I went from like southern Kentucky to northern Kentucky and dropped, jumped like one whole you know, from uh, 7A to to 6A or 6B. And uh, that was like kind of a big change for me. I was surprised at how different it was. So I can imagine going from Idaho all the way down to Missouri, <laughs> uh, the the change that you kind of experience in that time. Yeah, it is it is stark difference. Uh, I've got a brother who grows a big garden and, and we talk almost every other day. And, and he, uh, he said, I cannot believe he's got stuff growing already because he's got snow on the ground. <laughs> So yeah, it is a big difference. I I, I feel blessed to to be here and and to have such a long growing season and and you know with with a hoop house, you know we actually it, this spring has been so crazy warm. I I just like could not resist. I had plants going, so I put them out, and of course it got to eighteen degrees and killed them all. Even oh, in the no. hoop house. 
you know, I I knew that going in. I was gambling, but um, <laughs> the tree, you know, we've had a really warm spring this year, and and so I'm excited to get see get seedlings back out there. I'm not going to be gun shy about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we, I go through that every year and it's so hard because we always get a spell in January and February that are in their, you know, in the seventies. And I'm like, I'm like, I don't know. I could be planting. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, luckily I've gotten lazy too. So it's coincided with me not starting stuff as early as I used to just to try and push the season quite as intensely. Um, so, so it's worked out in my favor in that way. Uh, how, <laughs> how big is, can you kind of describe a little bit the garden that you're managing now? Like how much is in cultivation? So we've got, I think six different gardens here on the, on the property. Um, and none of them are really big. I think our biggest one is about a hundred by a hundred feet and it's got a bunch of raised beds in it and then some in ground beds. My wife's got a small flower farm out in front of the house that uh, she loves and guards fiercely. She she pushes me right out of it. She will not let me plant a thing in it. And then uh, we've got what we call the long bed. It's probably <clears throat> 150 feet long and about 30 feet wide. It's where we typically grow our pumpkins and our corn and you know some of the things that are tall or strong. And um, the our employees here last year <clears throat> really wanted to grow a big sunflower bed so we tilled up some of the grass and put in a 50 by something i can't remember the exact size and they planted it in nothing but sunflowers and just had had a ball with that so um and i got one hillside that i grow on that's in front of a shop and it's terraced and we terraced it and uh, it's a great place for perennials i mean are they in separate locations also because you're saving seed on some of these things so you need your your distances well even even that yes is the partial answer to that um they're all fairly close we're on 13 acres so we are spread out a little bit and they're but mostly it's for aesthetic reasons like this terrace bed in front of the shop and patty's flower farm is out in the front yard um because she her office is on the front of the house and she wants to see it when she's in her office and um, the main main garden bed is up by the seed shop. It's a barn that's here on the property is where we pack out our seeds. And um, it's there because um, the employees demand time in the garden. Um, to a person, they all love being out in the garden. So, um, you know, that's that's part of the, the benefit, I guess, of working at a seed shop is you get to go out in the garden, out in the trial garden and, and weed. and and water and, and harvest and all that sort of fun stuff. Yeah, uh, certainly a range of duties always on a farm, but I imagine on a seed farm, it goes from packing seeds and doing all the labeling and all that and weighing out and then also get to stretch your legs a little bit and go do some farm stuff. So that's that's kind of nice. Yeah, they love it. They actually do. Because for the most part, you know, we're they're in front of uh, machines that, that uh, divvy up the seeds and put them in a packet and fold and seal the packet. So, you know, this time of year, we're, we're just as busy as we could possibly be packing seeds in the packets, but yeah, they, they love getting outside and into the garden. So flesh out the business for us a little bit. How long, how long ago was it? I forget if you said, excuse me, if you did, but how long ago did you start the business? And then, you know, tell us a little bit about like, I don't know the marketing side. I'm always curious about when it comes to seeds, like how, you know, uh, what you've sort of set that up. I know some people will look, go to like conventions to do like, there's like seed swap sort of conventions. There's like the seed racks that some people will put in, uh, you know, various stores. And then there's like, you know, obviously you sell online. Like, can you talk about those two things? Sure. Um, so first of all, a little bit about the business. We currently offer about 450 different varieties of seed. Uh, you know, vegetables, flower, herbs. We we do cover crops. Uh, we also have some microgreens that we offer. And um, we're at about uh, 15 employees currently. And, um, yeah, we, we've really been growing uh, significantly. 
Uh, I think it was about, so the seat business has been uh, running and going for about, we're coming into our seventh year. And um, even just four years ago, we had two employees. So that kind of gives you a, a, a little bit of an idea on kind of the growth that we've been experiencing. Um, as far as marketing goes, we we sell from our website, of course. Um, we also sell on Amazon and Walmart.com. We have not yet gone into the seed racks and go into the hardware stores. Um, it's sure tempting. We have this great seed store here in Kansas City. It's called Planter Seed. It's right down by the River Market, so right down downtown. It's this old 1840s or 1880s building. And you go in there, and it's just got this old-timey vibe about it, like seed in the drawers and all that sort of stuff. I I, I love that store. And, um, if, and so... That is the one place that I've been tempted to to go into a retail space, um, but we haven't done the other. Mostly, just we haven't had the capacity to do it. It's a, it's on our on our list to build capacity to do, but um, but I do have a goal of getting into planters. Um, I need to go down there and talk to the manager and, and uh, see about getting our seeds in there. Um, those sort of stores, that's kind of where I really want to be um, in in the planters of the world. Yeah, yeah. Those, I mean, any sort of like tractor supply, not tractor supply, but a tractor supply store or like, yeah, those seed stores, places that people are going, especially right now, like looking for seeds. I can imagine that's where you want to be. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's ob- obviously a lot of seeds sold at Home Depot. And, and uh, the truth is we're way too small for that. Um, but, you know, you never know what the future holds. Yeah. And then, um, you know, the Amazon and Walmart thing is interesting because I noticed that when I was doing some research for, you know, this interview, I, I noticed that you all had a store set up on Amazon. I don't think I'd seen that before. What's the, uh, I mean, how do you feel about, like, does that, is it effective for your business? Does it, is it something that you've, that you feel like has been, uh, you know, worthwhile work to put in to get you know, an Amazon store and you sell through them? Yeah, I'll tell you, it, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Um, it's, there's an awful lot of eyeballs on Amazon, and so we get a lot of good exposure there. But Amazon is is a beast, and, and it's definitely their game, and you're playing their game. And so, uh, for instance, just this week, they completely changed the way things are getting shipped in to their fulfillment networks and we just you know for the things that we send to them we just had to completely switch we didn't you know there's not a lot of options on it so um so that's the downside to amazon the upside is is there's just a lot of people there and and we are getting you know um the the traffic and and the exposure by being there on amazon but it is I'll, i'll be the first one to say that Amazon is a very challenging place to to do business. Yeah, I can imagine. I'm thinking now just kind of like about the seed business in general and then getting into it coming from, you know, you have a background of like growing and and then obviously like doing the seed exchanges and stuff. But like once you started the business, was there anything that really kind of surprised you about the seed business? And maybe it's something like that. Maybe it's something like Amazon, but it could also be like laws and regulations or is there anything that sort of stands out? Um you know, the most surprising thing about the seed business is how much seed people are buying in August and September. I, I always kind of assumed that we would have a very busy spring and and then it would just taper off almost to nothing. You know, kind of that was my experience as a, as when I was farming in my youth was, you know, in the summertime, you're killing yourself, right, during the farming season. But in the winter, you just kind of take it easy. Um, and so I was kind of expecting the same sort of trend and we definitely slow, you know, we definitely have a busier time in the spring, but gardeners are buying seeds all year long, which was really shocking to me. And I'm certainly grateful for it. it. The bottom line of that means that I can keep 
my employees, I can have fewer seasonal employees and keep a good core of employees employed year round. So that's a great aspect to it. Um, as far as laws and regulation, um, you know, I, they're, it's pretty straightforward. You know, you need to be able to um, identify where a seed comes from and you need to do your germination testing which we do. We've got a setup here on site to do that. And then, of course, we send our seeds off to labs for testing. And you got to label them. Uh, you know, so we, and this is required by most states, not all states, but um, we put lot number, we lot everything, that um, all of our lots of seed, and we mark the package with those lots. And um, it really is helpful, too. It helps us, allows us to, track if, if there is a problem uh, we can quickly identify what the lot is and, and take that out of our, our catalog or out of out of production basically and, and bring in another lot to replace it the um so the thing about september and august is surprising to me uh as well because i would have thought i mean we do most of our seed ordering in like december and then you know a little bit mm-hmm. here or there throughout the year are those august seed orders um are those more like winter stuff or people already ordering for the next spring? I, it's got to be some of both. I mean, well, for one thing, um, you know, you got people in Texas and Arizona who are just ramping up about that time of year. They're getting ready because, you know, they start planting in, in October and November. And so that's part of it. The other part of it is I just think some excitement about the following year, about the year coming up. Um, and there's also just some, you know, we get a lot, because we're on Amazon, we get a lot of brand new gardeners. And so one of the things that sells really well in, say, the end of August is pumpkin seed. And I, when, as I'm shipping them out, I'm, I feel like putting a note in there saying, um, this probably isn't going to be ready by October, but you can try, you know what? So there, and we, we work on a lot of education to help people understand. So there is some of that too i i'm guessing um but yeah it's just surprising how many how much seed goes out the door in months when you wouldn't think it would yeah yeah no absolutely that's very interesting i did i of course i hadn't thought about that that is spring if you're in arizona <laughs> right? yeah, like it's getting sure. it's getting well sort of or at least it's getting ready to be your your main growing season um so uh, another thing that you'd mentioned too is you sending the seeds off to labs for testing. What are the labs testing? What all are the labs testing for? Uh, it's mostly germination testing. And, you know, there's specific standards that they test to. And we've, we've got the equipment to do that testing as well here. Um, so, we, in a sense, we do double testing. We test our own and we send it out to a lab. There is also some, for some of the seeds, um, especially like microgreens or sprouts, we get uh, testing done to make sure that there's not pathogens in that because it's so close. I mean, it's one so close from seed to, to, to eating it, right, with a microgreen. It, it's, a, it's a little bit different if you're going to put the seed in the ground and, and then two months later you're going to pick a fruit or, you know, a pepper or cut a head of lettuce. So for those seeds that we sell as microgreens, we do get that extra testing done to make sure there's no pathogens. Yeah, that is fascinating. I had never thought, I mean, I thought about that with something like, uh, yeah, sprouts, but microgreens, it hadn't really occurred to me. And it hadn't occurred to me that the seed company would do that testing. Yeah, we want to make sure it's safe and, and that our customers have great experiences. So that is something that we we rely on labs to do that for sure. And then in terms of patents and those sorts of things, like, is there, are there issues with having to avoid that or like, I don't know, checking to make sure a seed wasn't contaminated by a patented seed or anything like that? Um, no, we, so we don't, um, but we do have seed vendors. So we don't grow all of our seeds here. In fact, we grow a fairly small percentage of our seeds here. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is the isolation space. You know, pumpkins need a mile or more between varieties. And obviously that's really hard to get on 13 acres. And so a lot of the seeds have that issue. So we uh, use seed production companies who contract with seed farmers to grow the seed. 
And those, you know, they're in Arizona and California and Oregon. Um, and so they do a lot of that testing. A lot of it, you know, has to do more with, um, not with the patents per se, but the genetically modified um, seed is something that is just starting to become more of an issue for us uh, because in the past it, it was nearly impossible for a home gardener to get their hands on genetically modified seed. You know, it was mostly corn and corn and soybean and, and really farm seed. And it had really very little impact, um, even potential impact on home gardeners. Um, but that's starting to change a little bit. And so I foresee that we'll probably need to be doing some more genetic testing on seed to, to confirm that there isn't genetically modified, um, you know, that that hasn't cross-contaminated the heirloom seeds that we're purchasing from the seed uh, production companies. Yeah, that's an element I hadn't really thought about because I do want to talk to you about some of these, you know, at least this this new purple tomato that, is mm-hmm. is out now but um having to do more genetic testing will probably cause seed companies to have to raise their prices and stuff like it will like having genetically engineered tomatoes for instance mm-hmm. in this case where we have this new seed that's on the market that is available to the average joe which really like you said wasn't much of a thing before like you really wouldn't find genetically engineered food at at the farmer's market before it was just, you had to sign contracts. It wasn't easy. It's not easy to grow those crops and you definitely can't do it inadvertently. Um, but now like with these coming on the market, it could, you could see more contamination issues. And if you have to do more genetic testing, then, you know, a lot of seed companies may have to, you know, pass that cost on to the, to the, uh, farmer, which I imagine like is kind of an unexpected, you know, twist in this tale. Yeah, that's true. Um, it, you know, thankfully we get to spread those costs out over a lot of different packets, right? And it's, um, so I don't expect there would be a huge impact on the, the home gardener, but it definitely is uh, another expense, another pressure on seed companies. That's for sure. And, um, yeah, it, it's just a shame, you know, the, the genetically modified uh, I am just not a proponent of any of it. Uh, it just it, the the fact that it just goes out without testing to understand its impacts to me is the main concern. It's not that I know that there's going to be adverse impacts. There may not be, but they also don't know that there won't be. And it seems like before we just kind of turn these things loose in the wild, we really ought to find out. And um, it's like. If, to take it into the, the medical side of things, it's like sending a drug out and then seeing if it's hurting people as opposed to running the trials and, and doing the testing to determine if it will hurt people before you send it out. That's kind of the the way I think about it is they're just in a lot of ways just sending it out. And the real, the real problem is it's not really for the end consumer's benefit, right? The, the whole purpose for the vast majority of the genetically modified modifications are to make it easier for the farmer to apply pesticides and not kill the crop, which it means they have to go through the field less and cultivate less. But sure, it's easier, but to me, the, the weight of that doesn't compare with the, the unknown here, with what might occur with the, the modifications. Yeah, yeah. I and, and I mean, with this one, so this new, um, you know, purple, dark purple tomato or dark red tomato, I forget. Yeah, dark purple tomato. Um, they, you know, it is, it's their sort of design of it was to make a genetically engineered crop that was, you know, highly nutritious. That was sort of their aim. So it was going, it was sort of trying to like, I don't know, break apart from or break away from that vision of genetically engineered crops as being about pesticides and herbicides. Um, right. But it, it, it in, in a way that like is more bizarre to me and because it's, it, it's directly engineered around human health. And I feel like that's, that's complicated, especially when you're, 
you're not really, you don't have a lot of trials to produce to say like, this is safe. I don't know. Yeah. There's, there's something there that, that also as a grower and as an eater, a food lover, like I also find that strange. Yeah. And there's so, already so many great tomato varieties. Like we carry one it's called Black Beauty Tomato. It's absolutely the darkest purple tomato I've, I've gr- ever grown. And it's kind of unique. It's really dark. And then as it ripens up, it turns a really deep uh, burgundy red. So as an immature tomato, it's, it's the dark purple color. And I mean, it seems to me that you would be able to take the genes from from that heirloom tomato and and breed it and and get to a place where you could get the same benefits without inserting foreign genes into the tomato. I have a daughter who's studying genetics in college right now. She and I have long, long debates about gene books. <laughs> <laughs> we do not guide on. I'm just curious what those genes have spawned in. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't have it in front of me. I mean, I know that they were going for to increase the anthocyanins. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh I'm I'm not sure what yeah, which genes they spliced in. I'm pretty sure they used CRISPR and maybe if I get a chance I'll update this. But the um my I guess my question about it though too is like, is it are people asking you about it? Like, are your customers wondering whether what you think about it? Or are they asking, like, are you selling this? Or how do I know if your seeds are not genetically modified? Like, are you getting those questions now that this has kind of come to light or uh, come into the market? Um, not yet, but I I anticipate that we will. We have a very vocal customer base. And, um, and they, I don't know if you remember when the, Packets of seeds from China were just showing up on people's doorstep. Oh my goodness! That I mean, rightly so. That was that was disturbing, and and we had a lot of communication from customers about it. Um, so I, I am certain that we will, and um, and we, you know, this is the sort of communication that we we relish. We want to have discussions with customers about this, and and. Um, you know, every time I get a message about uh, something didn't germinate or something didn't grow, and we, we get a few of those, I, instead of, you know, thinking, oh, that's terrible, I really think it's great because it gives us a chance to visit with that customer and kind of really dive in and think about what what went wrong, you know. Um, the, one of the main things that folks do that leads to, poor germination is they just bury the seed too deep. Um, and, you know, there's only so much energy in that little seed to get it to sprout and get through the soil and get to grow and where it can start generating its own energy. And so anyway, having this sort of back and forth with customers is great. And uh, we'll, we'll dive into this genetically modified uh, tomato as well and be ready and, and have that conversation with, with our customers. Yeah. Yeah, and it says, uh, you know, that they isolated a gene in the snapdragon flower that turned on and off the purple color. So that was the that was the gene they they edited in. Okay. Um, I mean, snapdragon seem pretty benign, right? I mean, should we worry about snapdragon gene being in a tomato? Yeah, I don't Probably know. Not. <laughs> but that's just it. We just we just don't know, and and there for sure has not um, been any sort of clinical studies or trials or anything to to really rule out that there would be some harm from that and so i guess my position is why why do we do that because we can we can breed tomatoes i mean look at all the varieties of tomatoes that are exist in the market that all comes from natural breeding we can do amazing things with just natural selection and the way that these crops are breeded so why use CRISPR and insert the gene? I don't, I don't have a good answer why that's, uh, why that's the answer. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. And it's also interesting. I mean, it took them something like 20 years, I think, to develop this. And you're thinking about all the different crops that you could develop in the course of 20 years. You know, how many different tomatoes could we come up with in the next 20 years that are dark purple tomatoes that didn't require, you know, uh, 
uh, gen- any sort of genetic engineering. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Well, getting away from that, maybe we, I want to talk a little bit about cover crops with you. Okay. And because I know that you operate on kind of a smaller, you know, like you've, you, your background is in sort of small scale, backyard scale farming. And I think a lot of people in the backyard scale, smaller scale farming, and even larger scale farmers and, you know, everybody in between, like a lot of people have questions about utilizing cover crops and like, so can you give us your sort of rundown of like how you utilize cover crops and how that, um, you know, how that is, is in your business too? Yeah, absolutely. So I've used cover crops. I think actually you, I first learned about cover crops from watching your, your material. Oh, um, but the benefits of them, I, and you know, I, before that I hadn't really ever considered it. I mean, I, I do mulch really deeply, um, and so that was essentially my cover crop, right? Mulch can play many of the same roles, not all of them, but some of the same roles. And so I did an awful lot of mulching, and then um, for the last, I don't know, maybe coming up on 10 years, 10 years or so, I've been using cover crops, and um, they're just so beneficial to the soil you can tell where the cover crop has been and where it has not been very easily the following spring um just the the growth that's there and the way it keeps the biome happy and healthy and uh, breaks up compaction so some of the my favorite cover crops are um crimson clover is a favorite hairy vetch uh, for you know to lay down some nitrogen pull it out of the air and stick it in the soil i also use quite a few daikon uh driller radish uh plant that in beds where i've got some compaction um i'm i'm in i'm uh i wouldn't say cursed i have got nice soil here but it is a little bit on the clay side and so it can get really compacted and I'm actually my our main trial garden here is in an area where horses were kept, and so you can imagine the compaction that had occurred in that area. So, the daikon radish really does make a big difference in busting through that and breaking it up. And we also use some oats and some rye just to kind of hold things together. But I've also discovered that pepper crops are important in the raised beds. You know. Typically, and I'm the same, I, you know, you build a raised bed, you fill it full of great soil, and then you just, you plant it out, but over the wintertime, it just is bare and, and left open there, and you're not really protecting or building that soil and continuing to add uh, nutrients and, and just even the roots, right, that can be there from the, or, the organic matter that can come there from the roots. and so. Um, we've been doing a lot of cover crops in our raised beds as well, and it's actually pretty simple to do. Um, and terminating them is a little more challenging than, a, say, in the ground bed because, well, you can't just run a mower over them because they're in a raised bed. So it, it does add some handwork to it. But I've been known to to be on top of the raised bed with the crimper, crimping uh, cover crops down to terminate them when it's time. <laughs> nice, yeah. And we have really far away beds. We have uh, beds that are about 36 inches tall. <laughs> so uh, when I say I've been up on the raised bed, it, I mean, <laughs> uh, it's a bad image. It's not just a one foot off the ground. It's a, it's kind of up there a little bit. Yeah, that's great. Uh, the And then you all, what you like, you have sort of specially designed packets for, you know, compaction and stuff, or how do you do, how do you do your sort of cover crop? Like how do you design the packets? Like in terms of like what mixes you put in? Yeah. So we don't do any mixes in our packets. My, my philosophy on this is we'll put a single variety in each packet. And then um, we do sell collections. Like we have a soil compaction collection. And so it has three different packets of three different varieties in it. And, um, because not one cover crop really covers all the bases. And so, you know, we definitely like to have a legume in there that brings some nitrogen in. And, and 
I, I really like the oats or the rye that kind of just hold the soil in place um, and to prevent erosion. So I guess I don't know if that's really answering your question, but we pack out with everything in a single pack for one variety. And we've sized the, the amount of seed in each packet so it's enough to cover a four by eight grade bed, essentially. So if if um, if you're going to use three of those packets, say three different varieties, it would actually be enough for three four by eight beds because you would put a third in each in each uh, bed, essentially. So um, that's kind of the way that, I, my, in my mind, it makes sense to organize our offerings on cover crops and um, seems to work out well. We, we, you know, it, this is an area where I feel like we are doing, trying to do a lot of education and help people understand the benefits. And I'm starting to see some traction from that, which makes me excited. Yeah, that's very cool. And I feel like um, raised beds in particular are an area where cover crops get underutilized because like on a large scale, you have to deal with all the termination. And yeah. but on a small scale, termination can be pretty easy because you can just get out there with a knife and cut it all at the root and then just be done with it, you know, on a four by eight raised bed. Um, mm-hmm. So that's like one of the more intimidating factors of doing it on large scale. It's like, I have to get rid of it, but I have to get rid of all of it. <laughs> you know, I have to, I have to yeah. terminate all of it. But then, you know, when it's just, you know, uh, a four by eight space, which I love, that's how you do all, you all do your packets. Um, that's a lot less daunting and you get all those amazing benefits of cover crops. Yeah. Yeah. It's, they are amazing benefits. That is for sure. Um, it's, I just, you can, it's just night and day in the soil where they're at and where they're not. And that's even after mulching. Like I would, I, I have been and still on a few beds do some serious mulching. I, you know, I actually even started a, a leaf cleanup business just so I could have the leaves. <laughs> <laughs> My son would go out and we'd get some leaf cleanup jobs and he, he'd get the money for uh, mission or um, for college. And I'd get the leaves. And I felt like that was a really good deal. <laughs> that is a great deal. Yeah, I've thought about buying one of those little those little sucking machines that you just throw on a trailer and drive around and hit the curbs in the fall. <laughs> you're you're talking about my dream right there. I, just, <laughs> I dream about those big trucks that go around, suck up the leaves, and then come and dump them in your yard. Man, that would be awesome, wouldn't it? Oh, it would. It absolutely would. Um We've got a few more minutes. So I want to get one more. I, w- I definitely want to get one more question in because I was curious, like, just in terms of seed saving in your region, I know that you, you know, you mentioned a few of the big seed growing, seed growing regions like, uh, you know, Arizona, uh, California, up in Washington, Oregon, those sorts of areas are kind of known in the States because they're drier, but you are a lot like us. Like, there are seeds that are a little bit harder to save, but are there seeds that you feel like really are great to save in your region or things that you like feel like are under saved or under appreciated in terms of our ability to really grow out those seeds in a more humid climate? Yeah. I mean, it is super important to get the seeds dry. So, but really any seed can be saved if you can get it dry, which means you basically have to bring it into condition space. Like if, you know, as humid as it is in that time of the year, you know, June, July, August, um, I have not had much luck trying to save seeds and keeping them out in that humidity. So, uh, but it's as simple as bringing them into an air-conditioned house, right? That, um, if you can get them spread out and thin enough, uh, you know, in a thin enough layer, so, and maybe even on a screen, uh, and I, I have built some screens for this where we, you know, it's a two-by-two two area with screen in it so you can put the seeds on it and then we have a, a way to kind of rack those screens up so we can get and then I just put a little box fan in front of it of course all in conditioned space so that the air the ac is sucking all that humidity out of the air um i've had really good luck with pretty much you know i can't think of anything that i haven't been able to see save in that sort of set um but trying to do it out you know out in the shop or a barn that's not conditioned i i've tried it and um 
and I inevitably get some old and and I said a little bit. I'm I'm sure that there's some some places that you know that it could be done, but uh, I haven't had much luck with it out in unconditioned space. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's and are you also using like uh, seed separators and all that? Like, did you do you have like one of the fancy sort of you know gyrating seed separator machines as well and all the like seed cleaning equipment? Yeah, we have some of that, uh, and actually. You know, what's interesting, it's, it may be fancy, but it's not new. You know, that seat clip, that's, uh, that's really old technology. It's been around for, I don't know, at least 100 years. Uh, like the, one of the little seat cleaners that we use is, you know, if you can buy it new, but you can also buy a used one that's 80 years old. And they're just, it, it, it isn't super complicated. It's just a couple of screen and a fan and the seed the seed kind of jiggles over that screen and what's small falls out so the little winnowing machines if i can just describe kind of how they work so you dump the the unclean seed in at the top and the first one there's air blowing through it and it blows off all the light stuff and then on the second one the seed stays uh the seed falls through uh, so it's kind of the sizing, if you will, and the heavier, bigger stuff goes on over out the top. So on the first one, the debris is blown off and kind of blown out of out of the seed. And on the second one, the debris falls through and the seed stays on. Or sorry, I got that backwards. The seed falls through and the other larger debris stays on and goes out. And sometimes we have to run through a few times, but um, generally speaking, it works really well. Yeah, that's great. Like such a simple piece of technology. And then you just switch out the size of the screen that you need. And that's pretty much will do whatever seeds you need. Yeah, you got it exactly. So yeah, you you know, you need about 20 different sizes of screens, all with little different size holes in it. And it takes some finagling too. You got to, you know, you run a seed and uh, run some seed and you say, oh, I'm, I'm not getting as clean as I want it to be. And so you try a different size screen and, and it may work a little bit better. And so it definitely takes some, some finagling to get it just right in this machine. And it also matters how fast the, the fan is blowing and, and all that sort of stuff. Well, Daryl, I really appreciate you coming and chatting with me. Uh, this has been a lot of fun and I really, uh, yeah, really appreciate what you all have going on over there. Well, thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure for me. I, uh, anytime I get a chance to, to talk about gardening and kind of geek out a little bit on it. I, yeah, I'm all about it. It's, it is, there's just so much there. And the one thing I love about gardeners is they're all little scientists trying experiments. It, it is so common for, for gardeners to say, Hmm, I wonder what would happen if I did this and they go and try it. And it's, it just is so pervasive in this hobby or um, um, livelihood that people do that I that I think it's wonderful, and I, there's so much innovation that comes from that sort of attitude. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, no-till growers is sort of uh, that's its you know entire the entire spirit of no-till growers is that sort of idea of like, oh, I wonder if this would work, and we try it, and it sometimes does and sometimes doesn't but it's always so exciting to be engaged with biology in that way in that very physical way yeah i, I think it's one of the things i love most about your channel is is your willingness to just try things and then be so open about what worked and what didn't work right yeah i mean some i, I would say one out of every 10 works but that one can be a big surprise <laughs> and very fun you know, and yeah. those 10, you know, they don't, they're not that expensive, but it's, and it's, they're all very educational. So, um, but yeah. yeah, that's great. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad to have gotten to chat with you, Daryl. Thank you so much. No, thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. I hope you enjoyed that chat. Make sure to follow and support So Right Seeds at SoWrightSeeds.com. We have a link in the show notes as well. Real quick, some things that we have going on. First, a huge shout out to all the new Patreon members. The Patreon page has been absolutely humming lately. Thank you all so much for the support. The YouTube channel is going strong again with new content for the 2024 growing season. Check out that channel by searching No-Till Growers on YouTube. Hannah and I announced our on-farm no-till field days. 
for 2024 here at Rough Draft Farmstead as well. We only do those like three times a year because time is basically non-existent for me. Um, and tickets are limited because space is limited here. So check those out at roughdraftfarmstead.com. And if you want to come see my farm. As for other conference stuff, the last conference I'm attending this year will be at Riverside, California at the Grow Riverside and Beyond conference coming up here real soon, like the first week of April. All the links for those will be in the show notes and also linked in the show notes is our shop where you can find the Living Soil Handbook and hats and other merch. Buying those things through notillgrowers.com helps to support our work and helps keep this information free and open to anyone. If you appreciate that, that would be great. Alternatively, you can join all those new donors who support us through patreon.com com slash no growers and who not only get a bunch of discounts from various companies on seeds and footwear and all sorts of other goodies, but also discounts on things like the aforementioned farm tours here at my home farm. The Patreon page is the absolute lifeblood of our work and we dearly appreciate you and at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, we will even shout you out in our main episodes. So that's fun. Otherwise, thanks for listening. We'll catch you on Monday. Bye. <laughs>